of you are thinking immediately, wait, that's not the New Testament. <laughs> you are correct. I have picked this passage for at least two reasons. One is so that my students know I actually do read the Old Testament. <laughs> okay. I know I joke that I don't, but I do. Uh, the second is I thought, well, half our Old Testament faculty is gone on sabbatical right now. So if I'm going to teach from the Old Testament, I should do it now. <clears throat> But if you would turn to Exodus chapter 3, and we're going to read just the, I'm going to read the first 12 verses. We're not going to have time to unpack the whole chapter, but read with me if you would, if you have a Bible. Starting in verse 1, the text says, Now Joseph was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, oops. he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, but I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Would you pray with me? Our Father God, we come to you tonight knowing that you are the God who appeared to Moses in this burning bush. You are the God who remembered your people and their suffering in the land of Egypt. You are the God ultimately who has delivered us from our own suffering, our own enslavement to sin. Tonight, as we look at this text, this incredibly important text from the Old Testament, would you give us a fresh vision of who you are, of your holiness, of your goodness, your self-sufficiency, and your promise-keeping nature? It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about you. Some of you may know that's the way that A.W. Tozer starts his book, his well-known book, The Knowledge of the Holy. He goes on to write that always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God, just as her most significant message is what she says about him or what she leaves unsaid, for her silence is often more eloquent than her speech. Tonight as I look out in this room and see students who are thinking about coming to seminary, and being trained for ministry, and as I see students who are already being trained for ministry, and as some of you are already in ministry, the question for you tonight is this, what do you think about God? What does your church, or what will your church think about God? We could ask it also of ourselves as a seminary. What do we as a seminary believe about God? What do we say about him? What do we leave unsaid about him? This section of the Old Testament, and of Exodus in particular, may be one of the most important places in all the scriptures to go to answer that most important question. Who is God? What do we say about him? And the reason is because here God reveals who he is in such a remarkable way. He will reveal himself in the burning bush to Moses before he takes Moses to lead his people out of slavery in Egypt. And so what I want to do with you tonight is walk through these first 12 
12 verses. We could, we, we could really spend the whole time in the whole chapter because the second part of this chapter is where God reveals his personal name to Moses and, and by implication to the Israelites as well. But for the sake of time, we're just gonna focus on these first 12 verses. And what I want to consider with you tonight is first of all, God's call on Moses. Secondly, God's revelation of his own character to Moses. And then three, the company that God promises to keep with Moses and then by implication with his people. So we'll look at God's call, the character of God and the company of God each in turn. So begin with me as we think about God's call of Moses. And what I want you to think about here in particular in this first point is where Moses is when God calls him. And maybe a better way to think about it is not even where he is, but where he isn't, where Moses isn't. Because where he's not is in Egypt. He's in, the text tells us, he's in Midian. And that means he is not living among one of the most powerful peoples in the world at this time. He's in fact among the group of people that sold his ancestor Joseph into slavery. Think about that for a contrast. The man who's going to save his people from slavery is living with the people who sold their ancestor into that slavery. You can look this up in Genesis 37. Perhaps just as importantly, Moses is no longer apparently the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. He's working for his father-in-law, and the text says his father-in-law is a priest of Midian. So not only is Moses not with the people who share his religious beliefs, but he's in the wilderness, and he's with a a, a priest of a foreign religion. He's in the wilderness, in fact, at a mountain that's named, I believe, in Hebrew, wilderness. And it's his job there to tend the sheep. A job that the text of Genesis 46 had told us the Egyptians despised. In his former home in Egypt, is, we're told that every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. And to top it all off, <laughs> to me this is sort of the cherry on top here for Moses, they're not even his sheep. Do you see that? They're his father-in-law's sheep. He apparently does not even have his own sheep. So he's in the wilderness, living in a foreign land among people who bought his ancestor as a slave. He's married to a foreigner, doing a job to spies back where he grew up, and he's not even working for himself doing it. I don't know about you, but this does not seem like a very promising start. If you were to turn, you don't have to, but if you turn to Acts chapter 7, verse 23, we're told that Moses is about 40 years old at this point. So in my sort of twisted imagination, I like to imagine Moses going back home for his 20th high school reunion at this point and trying to give an update to his former friends in Pharaoh's palace. This is surprising and so unlike the way we operate. We know, of course, from Moses' birth that he is destined for greatness. The text has made that abundantly clear in the way and the the circumstances of his birth. But when would you have picked Moses? (laughs) If it were up to you, if it were up to me, I would have called Moses when he was at his prime, when he was living in the Egyptian court, ideally before he's made a mess of things by killing the Egyptian. He presumably spoke the language, he knew the customs, he understood their religious beliefs. As an adopted member of the royal family, he must have been well known and had connection to power. He was, interestingly enough, so Egyptian that that's how the Midianite daughters identify him in the chapter before this. Remember this, when he goes to the well and he helps them with the water, they think he's an Egyptian. And all this suggests to me that the right time to call Moses would have been back in Egypt. But that's not when our God calls him, is it? Our God knows better. You see, when God calls a servant, God wants them to be prepared for it. And God knows that the preparation needed to do the job he's given us is often very different from what we think it is. And the most important preparation that Moses got is not his Egyptian upbringing and whatever education came from that and socialization and all the rest that came from living in the palace, useful as that must have been. No, friends, the most important preparation that Moses needed for the job that God had for him was humility, was humility. So like David, who would come long after Moses, God gives Moses time with the sheep to teach him what it looks like to be a humble shepherd of God's people. And should we not pause at this point and just think of ourselves as you are here in this room, some of you already preparing for ministry, 
some of you thinking about it very seriously. Because this is a point the Bible often reinforces. That God loves to use the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. That he often humbles us before he calls us. You know, one of the things that I worry most about here at the seminary as a professor is the students who are successful early in their ministries. The reason I tend to worry more about these students is because too often those students might not be mature enough to handle success when it comes. You haven't faced enough difficulty yet. You haven't been tested. You haven't faced real failure or the sting of embarrassment. In other words, you haven't been in the wilderness like Moses had been. And it leads me to ask this question of you as you think about your own life and what has brought you up to this point. Because some of you may be here thinking, I just don't know if I could ever go into ministry. Given my background, given my history, given my past. But I wonder what difficulties in your life God has allowed in his good providence precisely so that you are matured and humbled and better prepared for his service. You see, one of the lessons from this text for those of us who are preparing for ministry is simply this. Do not despise difficulty when it comes. Don't resent it. Don't try to avoid it. Those difficult wilderness periods that you face in your life are not outside the scope of God's providence. As a child of God, not all of the pain that God brings into your life is his displeasure with you. It may well be his preparation of you. And that is exactly what was the case in Moses' for, in Moses's life. Where he is as this chapter opens gives him no reason at all to think that he is soon to do what he is about to do for his people. Nothing. But God knows exactly what he's doing. When God calls a man, he knows the right way to prepare him. Now the second important thing we need to look at here is what does this text tell us about God's character if that's the surprising nature of when and where God calls Moses, what does this text have to tell us about the God who calls Moses to serve him? So look with me. All that, by the way, is just verse 1, so we're going to be here all night. <laughs> so, no, <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, but turn with me to, to verse 2. Look with me. The text says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. This is no doubt one of the greatest moments in the history of salvation. Now, one question is, why does God appear to him in a bush? I do not have a great answer to this. I meant to ask Dr. Thigpen before I got up here and I forgot. So afterwards, everybody go ask him, okay? We'll all, go, we'll all go ask him the same question. The best answer I've found from those I have read on this, the closest in that thing I can get at is the word for bush in Hebrew sounds a lot like the Hebrew word for Mount Sinai, which happens to be where he is. So there's a, maybe a bit of a word play here. Other than that, I don't see any great significance in the bush or in the fact that it's on fire in the wilderness. Uh, a few years ago, I took my students out hiking in the Tonto National Forest, just uh, north of Scottsdale. Um, and as we were walking, we happened to come across one of these desert trees that was not just dead, but burned. And what was curious about this tree as we were looking at it was that the tree was clearly burned, but nothing else around it was. And so I got to asking my quit, uh, kids questions, as, as good dads do on hikes like this, you know, teachable moments. I said, kids, what, how, do you think this, how do you think this got this way, you know? So we started throwing around ideas, and the best reason we could come up with, the best cause, was that maybe it had been hit by lightning, and it managed to burn down, and nothing else around it caught on fire. Maybe the flames didn't reach beyond the tree. I suspect that perhaps, as a shepherd out in the wilderness, Moses himself had perhaps seen this. Maybe he hadn't seen a bush on fire before, but he had seen one burned like this. But what's really important is that the text does not draw our attention to the fact that a bush is burning. And Moses' attention is not drawn to that fact. Look at the text more closely. 
Verse 2 says, the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning. Yet it was not consumed. And then look what Moses says in verse 3. He doesn't say, look, I'll turn aside to see a bush on fire. No, he says, why the bush is not burned. That's what seems to catch Moses' attention. It's not just that a bush is on fire in the wilderness. It's that a bush is on fire in the wilderness, and it's not being consumed. Now that is odd. That is odd. So the surprise, then, is not in what is happening to the bush. The surprising feature is what is not happening to the bush. And so allow me to highlight four characteristics of God that I think come to expression in this incredible experience that Moses has. The first is that God wants to teach Moses and us that he is holy. Now, technically, the text does not say that God is holy. If you read it carefully, you'll notice. Rather, it says the ground is holy. And one of the things that's interesting about this text is that this is the first time in the Old Testament this word holy is ever used. From here on out, it will become very common used some 70 more times just in the book of Exodus. So we should probably pay attention to it here. I'm going to cut to the chase here and give you a definition of holiness. The word holy can refer to something being devoted to God for special use. Think of the sacrifices or the temple or even the priest's garments. When applied to things like this, holiness does not mean that they are somehow morally upstanding. Does it? How can priest's garments be moral? No, it means they've been set aside for his special use. So in this sense, holiness means something like our word sacred. It's something that shouldn't be profaned or made, made use of for ordinary means. To do so would be like if you had like really expensive fine china that had been, that had been gifted to you by a great grandmother. And you just like whipped it out for a casual picnic one time. Or like if you showed up at class on Tuesday, ladies, in your wedding dress. You see, these are things that are designated for special use, <laughs> and you're supposed to use them for those special things. They're set apart, they're distinct, they're set aside. And so, wearing a wedding dress to your class is not appropriate because your dress has been designated for something very special. And this is part of what it means for God to be holy. He is distinct from us, His creation. He's set apart from it and separate. He's not just different in degree. He is different in kind. He's not just a big version of you at your best moment. <laughs> he is categorically different. And this, I take, is why Moses can't come near and why he must remove his sandals. is because he is on holy ground. When God appears, even the ground, which a moment before this had been ordinary ground, now becomes holy and must be treated differently. You see, the whole episode here with Moses, the burning bush, is a foreshadowing of God's later appearance to Israel in Exodus 20 when he gives them the Ten Commandments. And I won't go through all these in detail, so I'll just list them for you, but there are, there are at least six interesting parallels between that passage and ours. Both those places have an invitation with a warning not to come too close. Both of them have fire. Both of them describe faces that need to be hidden from God's sight. Both have miraculous signs, both call for obedience, and in both cases, they happen at the exact same mountain. And all of this is designed to reinforce for us the basic point that God is holy. He must not be treated as common or ordinary. He is anything but. He is, in a word, holy. Now, all this connects with the image of fire, with the second point about God. He is self-sufficient. Because normally, you know how fire works. It requires two things to keep burning, right? Oxygen and fuel. And if you remove either one of those two elements, the fire goes out. And that's what makes this fire so unique. It burns, but does not consume the fuel that it burns with. The bush is burning, but not burned up. And I take it that one of the things God is telling Moses through this picture is that God is totally self-sufficient. He lacks nothing, and he depends on no one. He has no need from his creatures. 
The way Paul says it in his speech at Mars Hill in the book of Acts is this way. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. You see, no one gives life to God. No one gives him anything. So much so that when he decides to appear as a flame of fire, even the fire no longer needs fuel. It's self-sufficient. Now, one of the ways I find this so remarkable, the more I think about this element of God's self-sufficiency, is that it's so different from us. When we pursue self-sufficiency, is it not the case that so often it leads us into being selfish or protective of those things that we are self-sufficient about? Often when we are trying to be self-sufficient, we converge into being self-absorbed or growing inward and less aware of the needs of those around us. Is that not true? But not with God. Not at all with God. His self-sufficiency is true and innate such that for him to give is never a loss to himself. For him to give does not leave him with any less. He doesn't lack as a result of giving. That's why someone like Jeremiah can say in the book of Lamentations that his mercies are new every morning. <laughs> it's not because while we were busy sleeping, he was out there hunting for more mercy. <laughs> I've got to restock. No, his mercies are new every morning because he didn't run out the day before. For him to give mercy does not leave him with any less mercy. As the ocean never lacks for waves, so God never lacks for goodness and mercy. He is his own source for everything he is. And that is exactly the opposite of you and me. So God is showing Moses that he is holy and that unlike Moses, very unlike Moses, he is self-sufficient. Does not depend on anyone, certainly not Moses. There's one further observation, though, about the fire imagery before we leave it that's true about God. Because it's true that God is often described as fire or with fiery language in the Bible. <clears throat> Stretches all the way back to his covenant with Abraham, if you remember this, where he appears as a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch in Genesis 15 when he makes a covenant with Abraham. And there's a number of reasons why God presents himself as in fiery language. He's powerful. He purifies. You might think that he can heal like the way we cauterize a wound with heat. <clears throat> but I think it's also because God is trying to teach us that he is not to be trifled with and that he cannot be controlled. You see, there is one feature of fire in particular that I think God ex that explains God's appearance in this way in our particular text. And it's this element that God both draws us to himself... But that if we're not careful and we get too close, he also expels us. And, and to illustrate this, I, I just want you to think if you've ever seen a small child in front of an open flame. <laughs> I have small children. I've seen this now a couple times with my kids in the winters when it finally cools off and we have fires in the backyard. <clears throat> it's happened every time with my little ones. They see that flame and what do they do? They just want to what? Touch it. <laughs> it just, you just have to touch it, right? Because fire, if you think about it, it's so incredible. It's, there's nothing quite like it, right? First of all, it's bright and it gives off light. But second of all, the way it moves, you can't quite explain it. You've never seen anything like this. It's the only thing that sort of goes up. So in that sense, it, it sort of has these strange movements that are like water. But water always goes down. And water you can hold. And fire sort of looks like it moves like water. So you want to touch it. But you can't. You can't. You see, I think what, what God is teaching us through the fire imagery here in the burning bush is that God is like fire. He draws us to himself. We know we want a relationship with him. In fact, we know deep down that we need it. We pine for it. We search for it. Sometimes we search for it without knowing he's what we're searching for. <laughs> but we can't have a relationship with him on our own terms. Because God can't be manipulated or controlled any more than a child, or frankly, any more than you or I, can hold fire in our hands and control it. <clears throat> I think as an aside, this is one reason why idolatry is so tempting to us. If you think about what idolatry is, I, I, one way I would 
<clears throat> commend to you to think about idolatry is that idolatry is a desire to find safety and security, the kind of safety and security we're meant to find in God, but in other things, yeah? But the question I always have is like, but why is it so tempting to us? And I've come to the conclusion that I think one of the reasons why idolatry is so tempting to us is because the idols that we worship not only offer or promise us that safety and security that we need, but they promise us to do it in a way that we can have just a little bit of control over them. Yeah? Just a little bit of control over them. You can manipulate the idol in a way you can never manipulate God. So if you think about the things that people worshipped as idols in the ancient world, they're, they're all the kinds of things that had enormous control over their day-to-day lives. They're things like the sun and the rain, things like the sea, things like fertility, right? War. Then if you think about the things that we worship today, things like technology or money or prestige, what gives them their appeal is that they promise us that safety and security, but they do so with the second promise that is, and you can control me a little bit. And that is very enticing to us. But what God is saying to Moses in the burning bush is, Moses, I will draw you to myself. You need me. I have safety and security. But I am not like the idols. I cannot be controlled. I cannot be manipulated. So God is showing Moses that he is holy, that he is self-sufficient, but that he cannot be trifled with. He cannot be manipulated. And because of all this, the last thing that we learn may be one of the most important that we learn from this text about God. Because God is not just holy, not just self-sufficient, not just someone who's not to be trifled with. He is also, the text makes clear to us, the kind of God who makes covenants and keeps covenants with his people. And this God has not forgotten his people that he made a covenant with back all the way going all the way back to Abraham. You see, he led his people to Egypt to make them a great nation, and he will lead them out. And one sort of minor, but I think very real reminder we get in this text of who God is and his, his ability to keep his promises is the way God addresses Moses from the burning bush. I don't know if you noticed it, but look in verse 4. When God calls out to Moses, he does not just say, Moses. He says, Moses, Moses. Now, this is the kind of detail that you have to be a professor probably to notice. (laughs) Some of you are thinking, yeah, that doesn't seem very significant. And I didn't at first either. But let me make a case to you that this is actually quite significant. Because as you think through the whole of the scriptures, ask yourself, where else are people addressed twice by name? And if you were to go through the full list, there's not too many of these. I think you would find the case, find it to be the case, that they are always at moments of great poignancy in a person's life. Or at a turning point in God's relationship with them or with his people. So for example, it's Abraham just before he brings the knife down on Isaac. The voice calls out to him, Abraham, Abraham. Or it's Samuel as a little boy when the voice calls to him, Samuel, Samuel. Or is it not Jesus with Saul on the road to Damascus? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Perhaps most famously and above all, is it not our Lord on the cross when he cries out, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? But perhaps the most relevant comparison to our text here is the last time God had addressed someone like this with two names right in a row was in Genesis chapter 46, verses 1 through 4, with Jacob when God tells him to take his family to Egypt. You don't have to turn there, but it's, the text says, So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to God, the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel, that's, that's Jacob, in visions of the night and said, listen, Jacob, Jacob. And listen to what Jacob says, here I am. So when we hear this and we hear the voice saying, Moses, Moses, and then Moses says, here I am. If we've been reading Genesis up to this point, we're supposed to go, oh, I've heard this before. And then listen to what God says immediately after he addresses Jacob this way. It says, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. You see what God is reminding Moses so poignantly right here at this point? He's saying, Moses, look, I'm not just holy, right? I'm not just self-sufficient. I'm not just not to be trifled with or messed with or manipulated. 
He says, I'm the God who knows you. I'm the God who's been with your ancestors. I know how they got there, so of course I know how to get them out. I know them, and now I know you. And I want you to know me too, Moses. I am the God of your father, and that means I'm also the God who keeps his covenant promises. What greater hope could Moses have? And in some ways, what greater hope did he need to be given? That he served a God who keeps his promises. A God who is true to his own character. And what a world of hope that creates for us too. So finally, having looked at God's call of Moses, and then seeing something of the character of God that's revealed in this image of God in the, in the bush as a flame, consider something of the promise that God gives to keep company with Moses. He tells Moses that he has heard the Israelites cry for help, and he plans to deliver them. And he's going to take them to a spacious land, a land so spacious it can apparently, according to the list of ites, <laughs> that it, can hold, it holds six of them, right? That means there's a lot of space. And more than having a lot of space, it's very fruitful, flowing with milk and honey. Two signs that this is going to be very fertile. Your crops are going to grow well, and your animals are going to have plenty to eat so that they will produce milk. It's thus an indication of tremendous blessing that awaits them. What a great message of promise for where the Israelites were. (laughs) They were certainly not in land flowing with milk and honey. They didn't even have straw to make the bricks. So I imagine that at this point, Moses is sort of tracking with God right up until about verse 10. Because up until then, in the text, all the pronouns have been first person. I don't know if you noticed that. But God says, I will come down. I will deliver them. I will bring them up. I have seen their oppression. And then God says, and I will send you. (laughs) I will send you. And I, I'm not 100% sure exactly on Moses' initial response here, whether it's an attempt to avoid being sent or whether it's genuine humility. By the end of the chapter, it seems like he is, there is some part of it that is definitely trying to avoid the task, right? So perhaps that's already present here in this early response of Moses to God. And maybe we don't ultimately at this point have to choose because maybe Moses really doesn't think he's anything special enough for this role and maybe he is already feeling hesitation about it. But regardless of exactly what's going on in Moses' heart at this moment, the answer from God to Moses' doubt is what's so important. Because God promises to be with him. He's already said to Moses, Moses, I'm the kind of God who keeps my promises. So now let me give you a new one. Verse 12, God said, but I will be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain and as we keep reading the book of exodus of course that's exactly what happened because he is at mount sinai when this happens it's sort of a surprising sign because it's a future sign and in this it's different the signs he will give him in chapter four here shortly it may be because god wants moses to follow him based on his word and not just on a sign either way it is a promise that god keeps Because he will lead the people to Mount Sinai and the Israelites will go there and they will serve God on that very moment, on that very mountain. That's the great promise. And what's so great about this promise is that in fact, it's in one at one in one sense, it's the great theme of the entire Bible. (laughs) It's certainly the theme of the book of Exodus, of how God is going to dwell with his people. How he's going to be their God and they're going to be his people. But we could easily extend that beyond the borders of the book of Exodus. Because one way to read the Bible is is to read it as a great story that God is writing that stretches from creation to new creation in which a people who have failed him, rebelled against him by taking matters into their own hands, have ended up as a kind of shadow of their former selves, enslaved and helpless to sin. What they need is a holy God, this holy God who's like fire, who draws them to him. What they need is somehow to be able to meet with this holy God, to have their sin dealt with, to have him save them from it. And this is exactly what God promises to Moses. And it's what he will promise and do for Israel. And ultimately, isn't this what he promises and does for us? You see, here in Exodus 3, God promises to be with Moses and bringing them out of Egypt. But we know the rest of the story, don't we? We know that the real Exodus 
comes with Jesus, who's Emmanuel, or God, with us, <laughs> right? He's the one, as Matthew tries to show, you know I was going to go to the New Testament eventually, didn't you? I had to, I had, how could I, yeah, I have to. <clears throat> but is this Matthew's point, is to say that he's God with us? And the point of the book of Hebrews, and even the point of something like the book of James that tells us that God has given us a new law in Jesus, because what the Bible is trying to tell us again and again and again is that someone greater than Moses has come. And he delivers us from a far worse slavery than what was experienced by the Israelites. It's our slavery to sin. And he gives us, as James says, a better law. He calls the royal law. And finally, and here's an important difference between Jesus and Moses. Jesus is the one who takes us all the way in to the heavenly promised land you remember this part of the Pentateuch where Moses gets right up to the promised land and then isn't able to go in friends I wonder if you have thought about the way that Jesus is so much better than Moses he does not take us up to the promised land and then say good luck I'm sure Joshua will do a fine job <laughs> he goes all the way there for us and takes us with him Friends, this is the God then who calls, who often calls us at our weakest moment, who calls us not in spite of the pain and the suffering we've experienced, but oftentimes because of it. He's the God whose character is holy and self-sufficient, who draws us to himself like fire, and who keeps his covenant promises. And he keeps the most important promise of all through Jesus, that promise to be our God so that we can be his people. You don't have to turn there, but I couldn't help but tonight as I was looking over this sermon again to think of the text of Revelation and that picture of the new Jerusalem in Revelation chapter 21. And just listen now through the lens of the book of Exodus and through this encounter that Moses has at the burning bush. Listen to the great promise that we look forward to in the new heavens and the new earth. Verse 3, John says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be to them as their God. Friends, as we come to a close tonight, I remind you of the question that we started with. What comes into your mind when you think about God? It's the most important thing about you. And Phoenix Seminary, hear me. This is is your God. Would you pray with me? Our God in heaven, you are a God who has called the people in this room to serve your people. We know we will not be of the stature or salvation historical importance of Moses. But each in our own ways, Lord, we have been called out of places of darkness, despair, places that seemed as far away from your plans for us as could be. But that is the kind of God you are. You take our humility and you use it for your glory. You resist the proud but give grace to the humble. You are a God indeed who is holy, set apart, so different from us. You're self-sufficient. You're not like us. You don't need us. You don't depend on us or our ministries or our talents or our skills. Instead, we need everything from you. You're also a God not to be trifled with. Like fire, Lord, we dare not play games with you. Which is why it's so incredible that you are a God who's committed yourself to us in covenant promises. You have promised to be our God, and promise that we can be your people despite our sin. Finally, God, we're so thankful that you have promised to keep company with us. Lord, for these students, for my, my colleagues and fellow staff, there will come times in our ministries where we think, this is it. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> That's all I got. And in those moments, what we will need to remember is that you are our God and that you have promised to keep company with us. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.
Thank you very much, Dr. Gurry. I really appreciate you opening God's word and feeding us with the bread of life. We are finished for this evening, uh, and thank you again for being here. Uh, there will be refreshments available uh, as you leave. If you'd like to linger and chat, that's fine. Uh, please do, feel free to do that. Uh, also feel free to linger and chat in here. Uh, but thank you for being here. And what I'd like to do now is before we go is to uh, read one of the great benedictions from Hebrews. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>